welcome everyone to our session today. Um, we have a lot of really good talks, and so I don't want to spend too much time. I just thought it would be nice to let you know who our speakers are. I should just say, I'm Laura Kudzanski. I'm from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I was trying to think if there's anyone else here from public health. I might be the only one, but learning a lot. Um, anyway, and I've done a lot of work my, in, in my own uh, uh, research on measurement of well-being and um, in fact, we had a workshop of our own some years back and produced a book out of it, if anyone is interested. And, uh, but, but, but we didn't come down on anything as simple as one item. <laughs> we did say that might be useful under certain circumstances. But today we're going to talk more about that. So we've got um, Dr. Alex Bryson from University College of London, who's a professor of quantitative social science um, at UCL Social Research Institute. Um, Dr. Johannes Eichstecht, who's a computational social science at Stanford and has lots of, I should say all these people have lots of awards and joint appointments and, and wonderful accolades, which I won't spend time on. But, um, and we have Luciano Esposito Siewebuker, <laughs> almost, uh, who's a professor at Centro Universitario Sao Camilo, which I'm sure I've butchered since 2014 teaching social psychology, organizational, and work psychology. And so all of us, all of them are social scientists, but coming from uh, perhaps different perspectives, weighing in on the topic of measurement. So we're looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. So I'm Alex, and I'm going to talk to you about Pulse as a measure of well-being. Um, and this is joint work with Danny Blanchflower, who's at Dartmouth. So. As you all know, we heard it in the plenary session on the genetics front, there's a growing literature which looks at associations between subjective and biometric indicators of well-being. This paper focuses on one, pulse. Um, as I was talking to George in the yesterday, there are many flavors of pulse actually that you can use in these estimations, but here we're just looking at pulse rates so the thing that you can easily measure yourself. Uh, it's been little used in this literature or this context, which is why we wanted to look at it. And partly we were motivated by the work of people like Kevin Lang, who've questioned subjective well-being metrics and their value recently. So we wanted to look at associations between subjective well-being metrics and, and a a quote subjective metric which has a cardinal scale and therefore if we think it might be a useful proxy for well-being in some ways it might be something that we could move forward with so this paper is published it's published in the it's just been published in the uh, um, uh, economics and human biology but i would say it's it's a fairly speculative <laughs> piece of work as you'll see so there aren't i'm not making strong claims for it and and you'll probably see why? Um, we're asking a couple of very simple questions. What are the correlates of pulse rate? Do they look anything like the correlates of subjective well-being? Um, is pulse correlated with subjective well-being? And we look at this both in cross-section and in panel data, looking at individuals over time. And then finally, <clears throat> we look at uh, an indicator pulse rate in people's mid 40s using birth cohort data and we look at the extent to which it's predictive or at least associated with subsequent outcomes that we might be interested in as economists or social scientists general health employment life satisfaction and and how optimistic or pessimistic you are about the future so the data that we use we me and danny like big n data um, we are using health surveys for Scotland and England, which are sizable. Um, so I think in any one year, you'd have about eight and a half thousand adults in the health survey for England. <clears throat> and we have one longitudinal data set, the 1958 National Child Development Study, which is housed in the Centre for Longitudinal Studies, which is part of the institute I belong to. It's a beautiful study. It follows people from birth uh, and uh, in age 42, they had a biometric study. So pe people's pulse being taken, but a whole bunch of other biometric things taken by nurses, which enter our equation. So this is an example of the sort of equation 
But we have in the back end of the paper, so employment at age 55 as a function of lagged employment in earlier parts of your life. Uh, pulse, we only have a single measure of pulse. Well, it's taken three times, so we take the average, but at one point in time. And that's one of the problems with the whole of this paper, I'd argue. We don't have time variance in individuals' pulses over time. But we plug that pulse rate in at age 42 as a right-hand side variable and see whether it predicts subsequent outcomes like employment at age 55. And we condition on a bunch of other things, including other biometric measures, such as something that appears more commonly in the literature, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. We have BMI. We have C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, and so on, just to see whether any correlations we find between what your pulse is doing at age 42 and outcomes at age 50 and 55 is robust to the introduction of these other metrics. We have health behaviours data lagged, and we have a whole range of familial and, familial and demographic controls in there, including many things that you would never have in any other data set, uh, such as basically what your mother's and mother and father were doing uh, when you were born. Um, so that's the basic flavour. And then the subjective well-being metrics that appear in the data are multiple. So you'll have heard earlier today there was a lot of people arguing about which metric. Me and Danny don't do that sort of thing. We do the lot and see, see, how, see what we find in the end. So you see here life satisfaction, WEMS, which is that uh, Warwick and Edinburgh well-being scale, classic GHQ for uh, diagnostic tool for um, people with um, mental health disorders, pessimism, general health, sleep problems. We've done whole studies on sleep um, and anxiety. So here's just a small example of the sort of thing you can do with the data. This is a GHQ. So um, uh, I think you all know what the GHQ is. And we're just showing here a simple correlation between that and pulse rates in cross-section pooled data for all the health surveys of England are uh, going back a long way, and you see a fairly linear uh, relationship there. I'm not going to show you any, um, any um, tables or anything. I'm just going to tell you what we find in the data. Essentially, correlates of pulse are very similar to those for subjective well-being, with one key exception. So we see pulse rates are higher amongst women, single people, the widowed, unemployed, disabled, less educated, those with higher BMI, smokers, drinkers, those on lower income. Those are all the same correlates as, as, as having lower subjective well-being. Uh, but pulse rates also vary by location. Uh, they are lower in more prosperous areas, higher in more deprived areas. Again, something you'd expect if you were thinking that pulse might be uh, an indicator, higher pulse might be an indicator of lower subjective well-being. There is one big difference, though, and it's a really interesting big difference for my colleague, Danny, who has written with, I think Carol mentioned it earlier, he's, he's one of the co-authors of the, this is what the U-shape looks like in subjective wellbeing. Pulse is different. Pulse declines with age in a fairly linear fashion until at least your mid-80s. So that is something that's fundamentally different. The second <clears throat> finding is that pulse is highly correlated with subjective well-being metrics and self-assessed health, both in cross-section and higher pulse is associated with uh, lower life satisfaction, more pessimism, all the, all, the, all the metrics crop up in exactly the same way. Um, lower general health at age 55. And because we're labor economists, we're very interested in the probability of working. So pulse rate, at age 42, uh, having a higher pulse rate at age 42 is predictive of a much lower probability of working by age 55. And that's even conditional on all the other things I've told you about, which include things like your father's occupation when you were born, uh, biometrically what you looked like in all other dimensions at age 42. There is this independent, significant and fairly substantial uh, correlation between pulse rate at age 42 and what happens to you in your later life. So we're simply saying that we think that social scientists can learn a bit by looking more at pulse rates in the future as a potential metric uh, when evaluating people's well-being. But that's about as far as we can push this paper. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah, and any questions? Why 42? Oh, because because that was this is a survey that costs lots of money, and uh, it was a moment when we got the money to do a biometric survey. I think since then, uh, in that data set, there is very little else by by way of biometric data. But the other birth cohorts also have biometric data now, um, so it's just happenstance. Yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to have had it earlier on. Um, so people like me try and push my colleagues who are designers of the surveys and try to seek funding from research councils and so on to try and get these data earlier on in life and then track them over time so that we can see time various variance in those key biometric because indicators. That, that's a specific inflection point where 42 is the critical point that's in other indicators. Absolutely, yeah. So two also, behind so each other. Do you want the one behind first and then, yeah? Okay. Um, two things. One is the Ausbank data. Yes. That contains biometrics from when children are quite little. Yes. Just to consider. Yes, um, I've talked to them. Yeah. But um, we've not done anything about yeah, it yet. There's that big data set. Um, and the second thing is, did you have any, I can't remember what's in the NCDS, but... Have you got anything on the ACE scores, adverse childhood experiences, so you can build that into your model? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we probably could do much more by way of introducing, introducing covariates from earlier in childhood, because we have fantastic psych psychometric type data uh, on, on behavioral problems, again, which we've been using since we have a paper on conduct, conduct pro problems in um, adolescence and long-term labor market outcomes over the whole of adulthood, which is revised and resubmitted in the general at the moment. So we're doing all this stuff all the time. My, my expectation here is that it's probably not going to hit the... Po I mean, if you look at the paper, the, the coefficients on pulse rates don't move too much. It's whether they start lower or are higher because of ACE experiences in childhood. So things like exposure to maltreatment. Yes, yeah, so I could, I, so there is a part, sure, there is a part of the paper where the pulse rates are the dependent variable. Mm -hmm. And I could certainly spend a lot more time on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. It's fascinating. Uh, as someone who measures my pulse daily, I'm... How do you, yeah. um, How do, you do that, by the way? I, I With one of these? I use tracker overnight and uh, I use HRV measures. So one, one interesting question is that a lot of people think that heart rate variability is a, perhaps a more insightful metric than the pulse rate, but of course it's much harder to measure. Yes. So, but but that, that aside, I swear my brain went with this was, one of the things you notice when you measure this is it's, it's the change from baseline that's really insightful. So when you're stressed, ill, under pressure, you see a, a big increase relative to baseline. Presumably these are just random baseline measures, but it's they are, using you're... it as a differential measure where you see a change in pulse indicating an underlying stress. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. What you would want most of all if pursuing this sort of line of work is 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 change check is definitely change, not just a baseline result, which is taken as the average of three three nurse measurements at a point in time. I totally agree with you. I've, you know, I, I, that's why I don't think we should push this paper very far, but I would be very, very keen to see people do it. What might be an implication for people who do wear, like, because an increasing number of people wear watches that track their pulse? Yes. They could get some insights to their, their mental well-being as well as yeah. their physical health, and I wonder what the implications are. Yeah, I mean, we said, we, that's what we talk about in the conclusion of the paper, that we, we think that these wearable devices, and Danny mentioned it in his, you know, talk just now, that, that this is the way forward. We should be trying to learn much more in real time about what our body is telling us and how that relates to how we're feeling. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is a literature more generally on pulse rates. So we were talking about it earlier because the man who knows more about it than anyone is is, is UCL colleague Andrew Steptoe, who's <clears throat> done a lot of work on this, not just looking at pulse rates, but pulse variability and also various composites of pulse, including blood pressure and so on. It's very confusing if you, unlike when you're a social scientist, you start reading the literature. Oh, there's, there's this flavour of pulse rate, there's that, there's the other. Um, but, you know, we've all we do is throw in stuff and see what goes on, including various metrics for blood pressure. And in fact, the blood pressure stuff is much more flaky in, in, in our regression results than, than the pulse rate. 
um, which is very is fairly robust to anything that you throw at it. But your point is extremely well taken. That's where we need to go in the future. Would you say, sorry, to keep talking. Are you saying that uh, knowing someone's pulse rate is a better predictor of their subjective well-being than than their blood pressure would be? Because that's interesting. Well, well, we weren't just looking at subjective well-being. We're also looking at labour market outcomes and so on. But essentially, it's, it, it appears statistically more robust in this data set with these data, yes. So it's something what I strongly encourage analysts to do is try and replicate stuff, not just simply what let's replicate exactly what Alex and Danny did, because you'll probably find that we did it more or less all right because it's pretty bog standard and easy. But let's do it across data sets and uh, over time. And let's see, let's build up a body of evidence and see whether we can deduce something from that. So I have a couple of questions. One is more technical and one is a little bit more conceptual. So I'm just curious if you put the subjective life satisfaction measure in the model where oh, you yeah. have the pulse in it, does it do, do they predict independently? Does the pulse reduce the predictive power of the satisfaction yeah so we do do that actually but i can't remember essentially we put in lagged satisfaction on the right hand side of satisfaction equations later in life and the pulse is definitely still there when i reread the paper yesterday i would have had to go myself <laughs> as a reviewer say quantitatively what's the size of this thing mm -hmm. and how does it shift around with these different metrics that you're plugging in basically the whole paper looks at statistical significance as much as anything else and the big question is you know what what sort of bang for your buck do you get so um i should have that answer in front of me and i don't well part of the reason i ask is because at least in, in among folks who work in health and think about kind of the interrelationship between mental health and biology and physical health there's always the question of whether the you know, biological marker is simply a proxy measure of the psychological state or if it is a downstream consequence of the sure. psychological state. So sure. if it's a downstream consequence, you could say it's a mediator yeah, in yeah. the relationship sure. between satisfaction, subjective well-being, and physical health. Whereas if it's a proxy measure, then it, you know, e either they could both have inform information in there um, but it won't really reduce the predictive power. Of that. Absolutely. So, so we do have, on the subjective well-being front, we do have multiple lags. Mm -hmm. We don't have for pulse. Mm -hmm. So you can just see what happens to that one and only right. pulse metric as you bring in these different lags, and it's pretty robust. But I, sh I can't remember what we found in the pulse as a dependent variable and the lags mm -hmm. of subjective well-being. I should, re I can't remember. Yeah. But I will also mention here's an advert. Polygenic risk scores, they are being added to the NCDS and the BCS, so the, the 1970 and the 1958 birth cohorts. And I am planning to plug them in, as suggested earlier today, into my earnings equations to estimate the gender wage gap, which is quite a brave thing to do, I think, actually. But that's what, that's what we'll be doing next. So they, those will be available um, to all of you. Um, um, in the very near future. Oh, just one final comment. So, so on the polygenic risk scores, to be really careful because if they don't explain, if they're not a strong instrument, it's going to be hard to... I'm not, I'm not really, you know, what I do know, and I, I very much um, recognise um, what was said earlier today in the talk about uh, biometrics, those polygenic risk scores are getting better in terms of their predictive power, and they do explain a fair amount of variance in things that we're interested in here. And I will be doing it in the spirit of plugging them in and seeing whether the variance in an outcome of interest, such as earnings, um, rises or whether other things are taken out by the introduction. of That's what I'll be doing in the first place. And then I'll probably come to somebody like you to see what, what I need to do better. Yeah, well, I was going to say, for folks who are interested, there's a number of data sets in the US that have repeated measures of pulse and repeated measures of subjective well-being. And I'm happy to... And which data sets are Health and retirement. Is Health and retirement, so right, mind, right. The Midas data probably has repeated measures as well right. as midlife in the U.S. That's really interesting data. to know. And there's probably a number actually of, of um, studies, large-scale studies of um, cardiovascular disease where they've been tracking people over time where they will have repeated measures because they've done a very good workup on cardiac. Okay, but I'm normally focused on a subsample of people who may be there in the data because they've got an issue or reached a certain no, age? No, okay. Okay, that's, so this is a great example of the importance of the crossover between social scientists and public health people.
because we, you know, I, we work on the BRFSS all, all the time, but that's a big N cross-sectional data. Right. Um, so we're probably less aware of some of the data sets that, that you're describing than we should be. Okay, thanks. Oh, just a quick, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I don't think written the end point here is quite arbitrary, but would you expect um, any differences in the results or numerical results, either um, if you were, if the gap between the numerical results and the numerical results are there? Well, well that's, a, that's a great question, but the thing I've probably underplayed is nobody's done anything like this before. Right? This is like pretty much the first study. That's the reason they published it. It's sort of okay, but it's the first. So um, it, as a consequence, we don't really know the answer to that question. It, it's sort of weird in a way, isn't it? I mean, it could be, and you will know if you're saying that there's pulse measured over the life course, just how persistent is an individual's pulse rate over time, yeah? That's a first order question in this context. And secondly, what possible theory can guide us in thinking that there should be a relationship between your pulse rate at age 42 and outcomes at age 55, conditioning a whole bunch of other things? I mean, maybe it's the same, it's the, maybe it's a person fixed effect. Maybe it's just, just part of who you are and your pulse remains, but we know it changes over the life course. So we got, you know, we've seen that from the cross-sectional data. We see it falls with age. But, you know, so I don't know the answer to your question. That's why I encourage others to start to do this work. Thanks very much.